ありがとうね兄貴おばあは<笑>そんなバカなありえねえ俺の妹が<laughs> Looking back at the past decade of anime, there are numerous series that were genre defining. Series that broke into the mainstream and brought about further evolution in the anime industry as a whole. These are shows that remain with you years after its original airing, of which its memes are still being spread, discussions are still going, perhaps even to this day the series is still going strong. With new entries, spin offs being released in light novel, manga, or anime form. Hearing this, you might already have come up with a few shows in mind. One might suggest Attack on Titan, with its amazing animation, epic soundtrack, and a story that is accessible to a wide audience. The result was a summer filled with. <laughs> or maybe Sword Art Online, with its intriguing story that draws you in by the first episode. A colorful cast of characters and memorable moments that really stick with you, at least until any tubers dissected this show every other week for three years straight. Or even Science Gate, for those who enjoy sci fi time travel stories with a healthy dose of cute science girls. With a decade out of close, I took some time to take a look at the shows that really define this period of time. And then I realized something while picking music for a video Yo, why are Ori emo music so good? And then I realized something. Yo, Ori Emo was such an important show for this decade. <clears throat> uh, I'll explain myself. <laughs> Any tuber David here making a video about an anime show for the first time since 2018. Bet you forgot this channel was mostly about anime. It's been a while since I wanted to do a video on an anime because we all know how much of a pain in the ass it is to get through the content ID system when you're a smaller channel like mine. I want to tackle this topic from a few perspectives, like a true anime reviewer. Okay, so when discussing Ori Emo to the unwashed masses, you just can't escape the inevitable weird looks from someone who's never watched it. Dude, that sounds like incest. Man, I don't wanna watch this weird shit. Is this a hentai show? Like, damn, just get over it. Oh, so it's my fault for talking about my little sister can't be this cute at the family dinner table. Pushing aside these common misinformed opinions aside, the story of Ore Emo, at least in the first season, addresses otaku culture. And this is one of the reasons why this show aged so well, because so much of what the show presents back in 2010, originally written in 2008, Is still very much relevant today. Remember, this decade we have seen anime become mainstream, for better or worse. That niche community of people torrenting fan subs have largely disappeared, and in its place are corporations trying to take your hard earned dollar rules. Most of us remember a time when anime used to be a niche genre and we didn't want to talk about it openly in fears of judgment, and that's really what the first season of Ori Emo focuses on. The main premise is about this pair of siblings who have drifted apart for some reason when one day it was revealed that the little sister, Kirino, is actually a huge otaku. But not just any kind. She's a degenerate that loves the little sister genre. Which, considering her position as a little sister, it is kind of weird, man. However, this revelation became a sort of bonding moment as she asked her brother, Kyosuke, to give life counseling to her. And in these life counseling sessions is where they decide to do all kinds of otaku related activities, which include but not limited to visiting Akihabara, offline meeting with friends, attending anime concerts, and becoming a light novel author. Yeah, that was a weird plotline for a 15 year old to get a publishing deal and get her own anime series, but I guess it was meant as a commentary of the industry. The general tone of the first season was quite light. And for us in the West, at least, is quite a fascinating look inside the otaku culture in Japan. The first arc concludes with the whole otaku issue coming into the spotlight when her hobby was discovered by her parents. Her father brings up how society views otaku as sort of social deviants and the negative influence these kinds of media could have on her. Akagi Sena, a side character, later says something about this in episode 13. And this, I think most of us can relate. 
As much as anime can be a hobby or interest for most of us, there are socially acceptable ways of engaging with this fandom. I think a lot of the flack that weebs get stems from their lack of social awareness, especially in a public setting. I've gone to a couple of conventions down here in Australia, and there were always moments of cringe that I took away. It brings a sort of realism to this obviously fictional show because, for the most part, her father is right. Kirino plays a lot of these adult erogays that are uh, 18 and above. The 18 plus rating exists for a reason, and Kirino, who is 15 at this time, really shouldn't be playing these type of games. We know this is a correct argument. But at the same time, everyone watching this video can use their own personal experience, okay? When your favorite Boru or manga site or The Hub asks if you're over 18, you most definitely clicked yes, even when you're not. There's a study that says that the average age of first watching pornographic material in the US is around 13 years old. And I'm quite confident within my demographic that you have done this. It is this sort of gray area that's interesting for the show to bring up. It reflects a genuine societal concern at that time, and without saying one side is absolutely correct, the show uses this tension to show how far Kyosuke is willing to help his sister out, um, because he got yeeted by his dad because of this. However, this also became a point of contention for the viewers. When the first season aired, a lot of viewers were weirded out by the incestuous themes, and at that time I didn't really see that between Kyosuke and Kirino. They just argue with each other, which usually turns into Kyosuke agreeing to do whatever his little sister asks him to help with, and often results in him degrading himself and making himself to be the bad guy in every situation. And his reward? Well, Kirino would throw him a bone and give him a smile or say a kawaii line every once in a while. His reasoning for helping Kirino in season 1 was because he is her Onichan. And in episode 11, Kyosuke says that he's helping Kirino out on his own terms. And I can't blame him, for the majority of season 1, Kirino acts like a little shit to her brother. The main character actually puts up with a lot of physical abuse from Kirino. Like if you're an older brother and your little sister does this to you, I don't care what culture you come from, that little shit needs some discipline. In season 1, there was the whole episode 12 good ending and true ending ordeal. Episode 12 had an alternate ending that leads to Kirino going to America for a few episodes. And it's these episodes that season 2 followed from. This kinda sucks, I remember only watching the first season and I was really confused when season 2 mentioned the stuff about America and introduced new characters that I didn't know. Who is this guy? Who is this chick? And how big are her melons? So in the true end of season 1, Kirino goes to America for a training camp and we don't see her for like 3 episodes. During this time, Kuroneko enrolls at Kyosuke's high school and we kinda focus on her character. Kyosuke helps her out and even get a little kissy from her. One day, Kyosuke receives a text from Kirino that got him worried. So he got on a plane and went to America to check up on her. His dad got him a ticket and away he goes. During this conversation, Kyosuke reveals that his real intention for coming here wasn't just to check up on her, but to actually persuade her to come home. He says that he was actually really lonely when Kirino wasn't around, and his decision to get her to go back to Japan is a bit selfish on his part. Somehow, Kirino is moved by this and returns home, setting up the events for season 2. And um, oh boy. Remember when I said there were incestuous themes in the first season? Well, season 2 was when they kicked it up a notch. To be fair, if a show is titled My Little Sister Can't Be This Cute, you know there has to be some incest there. It's rhetorical, you see, because Kirino is the true end of the anime series. So let's quickly talk about season 2 for those uninformed. Season 2 further develops Kyosuke's relationship with the girls around him. Ayase, Saori, and even this brand Kanako got more screen time. Also, I started to notice subtle changes to Kyosuke's character in this season. For starters, he's a lot more, um, how do I put it, cringy than season 1. For example, he invites Ayase to his room, Kirino's friend, whom he kinda knows. I mean, I wouldn't call them friends at this point. 
But anyways, in order for her to win Kirino over from this video game that she is addicted to, Kyosuke decides that ISA should imitate some of the dialogue lines from the game. Yes, I know how dodgy this sounds. Ayase obviously didn't want to do this, but Kyosuke is strangely persistent and eventually coaxes her into doing it. I know this is mainly played for laughs and giving the fan favorite character Ayase some screen time, but it really was a big jump from Kyosuke's character in season 1. And can we just talk about how he's super okay with being labeled as a siscon now? <laughs> And can we just talk about how he decides to set his phone background to a picture of Kirino in a bikini? That's some suspect shit. Also in this season, we have Kirino's fake boyfriend plan. Of course, Kyosuke has been hanging out with some of the girls in the series and collecting ovaries as he goes. So Kirino comes up with a plan of sorts. So here's her plan. She gets a friend of hers to pretend to be her boyfriend. Brings it up in the middle of nowhere and just sours the move for everyone. Then she brings him over to her place to introduce him, causing her dad to have like an alcoholic relapse. Then gets angry at Kyosuke for being suspicious about the whole ordeal. So after the cat's out of the bag, you might wonder what her deal was. Why did she do it? Is she trying to make her brother jealous? At first she couldn't put it into words, but she revealed a few episodes later that she just can't imagine she's not Kyosuke's number one anymore. She doesn't like the fact that her brother has a girlfriend. If it wasn't abundantly clear already, we are on a direct express on the sister route. Oh yeah, for a few episodes this season, Kyosuke was also dating Kuroneko, one of my favorite characters. It was going really well until she decided to break it off for some reason. Kuroneko hates how Kirino has become so distant now that she is dating Kyosuke and was hoping that she could still be her friend. So even though they broke up, the three of them remain on friendly terms. There was also this weird arc near the end of the season where Kyosuke moves out to focus on his studies. Of course, all the girls he had collected up to this point all wanted to take care of him, until it was decided that Ayase would be his caretaker for the month. Let's pause and for the moment, throw out all the tropes of anime out the window. If a graduating high school student living by himself, so 18 years old, has a middle school student, so 15, take care of him every day at his place. Is that not the best fucking life in the world? Oh, and at the end, she confesses to Kyosuke. What? Look, Ayase is another fan favorite character, but it's too little too late. She came in at the last second and couldn't make it. A moment of silence for our fallen soldier. So let's talk about the ending, cause oh my god, the audacity of this show. We start the final arc of the season with Kyosuke contemplating in his room. He goes, fuck it and breaks up with Kuroneko for good, making her seemingly swearing off falling in love ever again. Confesses to Kirino, who accepts, rejects Kanoko, I uh, didn't even know she likes Kyosuke in the first place, but okay. And finally, they were confronted by Manami, the childhood friend and final boss of the show. Kirino and her just straight up beat each other up. Eventually, Kyosuke yells at this guy, professing just how much he likes Kirino, and then rejects Manami. And then, and then they fucking kiss in a chapel, and then Kirino says it's over because they promised they will only be a couple until graduation, so their relationship returns to status quo. What about all the hearts you broke? What about your best guy friend who you dismissed? What about Kuroneko's little sister who is sad that they won't see Kyosuke again? There was obviously a lot of salt for the ending, and the author actually responds to this. I double checked the source material, and yes the anime ending was indeed the same as the ending in volume 12 of the light novel. So apparently, the light novel author, being based as he is, actually pushed for a full incest ending. However, he wasn't allowed to because his publisher, Dengeki Bunko, the fucking cowards, didn't want to take the risk. Therefore, under these circumstances, he wanted to try to give Kirino the best kind of ending possible. And this was the best ending he could give without giving a full incest ending. So that's the plot of the anime. I want to hear your thoughts. I know I'm bringing this up seven years after it's ended, but I want to hear some opinions and head cannons. Leave it in the comments below. Rewatching Ori Emo in 2020 for this video made me realize how well the art style of the show holds up today. AIC build definitely developed a style that is very clean and modern that doesn't seem to age. Now you might be wondering what other shows this studio animated. Well just look at that. It looks the same if not better than some of the newer shows airing today. 
Granted, this isn't an action show, but it does have a couple of fantasy scenes that are used to represent an argument going on. These scenes are always a joy to watch and is a nice flex for the animators to include in some episodes. I want to mention that whenever they go to Akihabara, and they go there a lot, the posters and the advertisements are actually real. Like here, there is Galgan, God Eater, and、uh, Sword Art Online. I'm sure there are way more visual novels in the background that are real as well, but hey, I'm no longer in that rabbit hole. Something else I really appreciate is a different OP animation every episode. Sometimes it introduces characters we've never met before, and other times it reminds us of returning characters. These changes in the opening sequence made me want to watch the OP every time, but I really can't talk about the OP without mentioning how great the opening song, Irony, by Clarice is. So Irony will go down in history as one of the best any songs ever made, especially the instrumental produced by DJ KZ, a member of Live Tune. It perfectly captures this upbeat, modern feel of the 21st century. In other words, this song makes you feel like an otaku living in Japan. The vocals by Clarice is also fantastic here, and it's hard to believe both of the members were still in high school when they recorded this song. Clarice went on to have a successful career, continuing to do OPs and EDs for Madoka Magica, Nisei Koi, Edo Manga Sensei, Nisei Monogatari, etc. I'm also glad they got a mention in season 2. I wanted to talk about the soundtrack, it's what originally prompted me to make this video in the first place. Okay, every AniTuber needs to give more credit to the OST of this anime because they are so useful. There's something about it that's just so pleasing to the ear and fitting for video makers. I know I've been guilty of using the Ori Emo soundtrack in so many of my videos, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of them in AniTuber's videos. The soundtrack ranges from underscoring mischievous moments to strolls in a city to even tender moments that tug at the heartstrings. Just listening to the soundtrack will paint a vivid picture of the type of scene that it was made for. Give it a listen, it's on YouTube. After the success of the first season, there were a couple of spin off video games. Two of them are visual novels, and the other one leans more towards、uh, photo kano games. What, what are these games called again? Pokemon Snapper with anime girls? Both of the visual novels are on the PSP, and I mean, who has a PSP? The visual novels are important because they're written by the original author and give us an ending for every heroine in the story. That includes Kirino, where they have kids! Okay, the main difference is that in the PSP games, Kyosuke is Kirino's cousin adopted into her family, so they're not actually blood related. But let's get our timeline of events right. Season 1 of the anime ended in 2010. The games came out in 2011 and 2012. Both Season 2 and Volume 12 of the light novel came out in 2013 with the incest ending. When the author was writing the Kirino ending for the visual novel around 2010 and 2011, he felt that none of the various endings in the game fully conveyed Kirino's feelings for her brother. So I assume when he was you know, writing the story for the games, something in the back of his mind was like, Hmm, but what if they were blood related and the madman did it? I believe one of the games has been translated, but I didn't much care for them except that I found out that Kirino had the caboose.、Bruh. I honestly don't like it when anime shows have these spin off games that contain seemingly authorial stories, because if you're the average anime viewer here in the West and you saw the first season, 
There are no legal ways for you to play the visual novels. It's almost as bad as animes today that lock their endings behind OVAs and films. I mean, why end your show while it's airing when you can get people to pay more money to watch that ending? So why did I bring up the show in 2020? It's an old show. It's a bit of a meme. Why should we care? I think it's important to recognize the impact the show had in the industry. Let's take a quick look. When the Japanese ethics organization of computer software loosened restrictions on depicting incestuous relationship in games in 1999, it ushered in a flood of little sister themed titles. So the early 2000s were flooded with this theme and caused a bit of saturation. By 2008, when Oreimo began light novel serialization, that little sister boom was pretty much over. So how on earth did it get so popular? It's believed that Oreimo, the first season at least, has a blend of traditional little sister story with a sense of realism. We get to see the usual dumb protagonist boob grab shenanigans with an honest reflection of society, society all for the price of one. We know how much of a brat Kirino is to her brother and how much of a degenerate she is when she is playing her hentai games. This might be why the sibling dynamics in Ori Imo appealed far outside the little sister Moe niche. Soon after Ori Imo's success, we saw a resurgence of Little Sister Media. We can look at these three shows which are completely focused on the Little Sister romance theme. As long as there's love, it doesn't matter if he's my brother, right? Which is about this girl with a huge brother complex. Recently, My Little Sister is Unusual is about a girl being possessed by a ghost girl and tries to seduce her brother. And there's also One of Them is My Younger Sister a show about a guy surrounded by five girls and he must find out who is his long lost little sister. Remember, these are just some of the light novels that received an anime adaptation. I'm not even mentioning all the little sister light novels that were published after Ori Emo. Even to this day, the series is still going pretty strong. In 2019, the 13th volume of the light novel includes a hypothetical ending for the fan favorite Yandere Ayase. This year, it was announced that the Ayase light novel ending will get its own manga adaptation. At the same time, Kuroneko and Kanako will get their own hypothetical ending in the light novel too. This franchise just would not give up. Just when you think you've seen the last of Kirino's click, they show up in Ero Manga Sensei as a cameo. These are the reasons why I think Ori Emo is an impactful show 10 years later. The first season gave us in the West a look inside otaku culture and how society views this phenomenon. And the second season, while divisive and controversial, still was very entertaining. The art style holds up extremely well today, and the music in the show is fantastic. I will never stop using its OST in my videos. There is an abundance of Ori Emo media and spin-offs to get into if you're a fan, and with new hypothetical endings being released every year, we might continue to see its impact in anime for years to come. Let me hear your thoughts on the show. Did you enjoy watching the show? Should they have gone full incest in season 2? Leave in the comments, let's discuss. Drop a like if you enjoyed this format. Long form videos are still quite new to me. Follow me on Twitter to keep up with my shitty memes and please don't look at my like tweets. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.